Welcome to Spaceship Earth. Total lifeform population unknown. Over the last 4.543 billion years, this generation ship has traversed deep space captured in the gravitational pull of the yellow dwarf Helios. Roughly 300,000 years ago, Homo sapiens emerged from the suite of archaic human populations and has since outlasted them all. For much of their existence, humanity experienced both struggle and leisure. Thanks to their complex capacity for cooperation, they formed communities where all could share in Earth's abundance of plants and game, where all would be given medical care, and where art and stories would entertain generations. Slowly, some would develop agricultural societies, which though not automatically and necessarily hierarchical, did make the development and entrenchment of hierarchies easier for those it would benefit, as the economic basis of their societies would shift towards the monopolization of territory. Soon, conflicts would arise between farming societies, pastoral societies, and hunter-gatherer societies. Soon, ancient civilizations would rise and become their own organisms with their own dynamics and entrenched hierarchies. Soon, much of humanity would be brought under heel to toil on the fields and die in the wars of their pharaohs, kings, and Caesars. This ruling class of humans had risen from the role of contributing crewmate to mutinous captaincy. Over the hill of space-time on Spaceship Earth, the people unknowingly built a terrifying behemoth, an idol of human and natural sacrifice, a punisher, a controller, a dictator of work and life, a rogue machine managed but not fully controlled by the elite class of human society, whether they take the form of transnational corporations or state institutions. This monstrosity has been called the planetary work machine. With the dawn of industrialization, the planetary work machine expanded rapidly and ferociously, for it is also a war machine against all who oppose it, internally or externally. The planetary work machine is a master of illusions of a better future. In its industrialized form, it presents itself as a beacon of progress. For surely, after this period of suffering, the next generation would enjoy more freedom, more free time, and more pleasures. In reality, it wants only to steal our time to produce more steel. It has ravaged this spaceship we call Earth. The furniture, its jungles, woods, lakes and seas, is torn to shreds. Our playmates, whales, turtles, tigers and eagles have been exterminated or endangered. The air stinks and has lost all sense of balance. And the pantries of fossil fuels, coal and metals are being emptied. Captain Humanity now veers dangerously towards self-destruction. Though Spaceship Earth systems prevent it from ever truly failing, it will certainly not be the same if this state of affairs continues. If the people of Spaceship Earth wish to transform this spaceship into a harmonious home, they must disassemble this machine, mend the havoc it has wrought and come together for a new beginning. Many a writer, philosopher, revolutionary and activist over the centuries has sought to take on this challenge. Today, Quadrant 868 Ambassador Andrew Sage will examine the work of 20th century Swiss author Hans Widmer, known by his alias PM, who made his own attempt in the utopian anarchist treatise of Bolo Bolo. Ship meets lock. 6th of December, 2023. I tried, but I couldn't ignore it. I couldn't get it out of my head. The rising chant of Bolo Bolo crept up on me in the night and followed me into my dreams. I first heard the strange term years ago, tried to understand it, but dismissed it for its obscurity. And yet, I could not banish it wholly from my mind. I had to investigate further. I had to understand what it meant. And now I do. If you're reading this, it's not too late. Before we can understand the strange world of Bolo Bolo, we must understand its nemesis, the planetary work machine. PM wrote about and warned against this machine prior to the collapse of the Soviet Union, all the way back in 1983. So his analysis is dated in some ways, but astute nonetheless. Despite many decades of change since then, its fundamentals have endured. The planetary work machine is a complex, global system orchestrated by international corporations and states that exerts control over society through primarily economic mechanisms. The traditional divisions of states are illusory. All countries are components of the same overarching machinery. But don't get it twisted. The machine is not homogenous. In fact, it thrives on its internal contradictions. The tension between workers and capital, 
private and state-owned capital, development and underdevelopment, and various other opposing forces that enable it to expand its control and refine its methods. At the core of the machine is its economy, an impersonal exchange of time and resources by atomized individuals through the medium of money, backed by the threat of violence. Although its power is total, the machine tolerates a certain level of resistance and unrest. It will consume and pacify radical movements, and when those methods do work, it will employ dictatorship, prisons, torture, and labor camps to bend its subjects to its will. Everyone, regardless of their background, is part of this planetary work machine. Just by participating in it, whether you're waged, unemployed, or otherwise engaged, we contribute to its purpose. As long as the machine exists, we are inside of it. It reaches everywhere. As PM says, If you try to retreat to a deserted valley in order to live quietly on a bit of subsistence farming, you can be sure you'll be found by a tax collector, by somebody working for the local draft board, or by the police. With its tentacles, the machine can reach virtually every place on this planet within just a few hours. Not even in the remotest parts of the Gobi Desert can you be assured of an unobserved shit. At the risk of simplifying the machine's vast complexities, PM identifies its three essential functions. The first, function E, is the collective brain and nervous system of the machine. It involves planning, designing, guidance, management, science, communications, politics, art, religion, and more. The information function. The second, function B, can be seen as the muscles of the machine. It involves the industrial and agricultural production of goods, execution of plans, fragmented work, and circulation of energy. The production function. Lastly, function C is perhaps the reproductive or cardiovascular system of the machine. And honestly, I'm losing this anatomical analogy, but bear with me. This function involves the production and maintenance of A, B, and C workers, care work, including medical care, housework, and childcare, as well as education, entertainment, recreation, and more. The reproduction function. The machine depends on three types of workers among the international workforce to carry out its three functions, because without them, the machine would eventually be paralyzed. These workers are divided by their wage levels, privileges, education, and more. A workers are the technical and intellectual workers, like computer engineers, consultants, graphic designers, or academics. A workers usually hail from industrially advanced countries, or the so called West, and are often highly paid for their qualifications. B workers are agricultural and industrial workers, with midland to miserable incomes and varying qualifications. They are the ones in the factory assembly lines and warehouses. Finally, the C workers are precarious workers, those oscillating between small agricultural and seasonal jobs, service workers, housewives, the unemployed, criminals, petty hustlers, and all who lack a regular income. A, B, and C workers can be found all over the world. There are C workers in the slums of North America, and there are E workers in the cities and suburbs of the global south. And everywhere, they are played against each other divided by wage difference, jealousy, ideology, and prejudice. The A and B workers are scared to lose their relative privileges, but also wish they didn't have to work and live so anxiously, while the C workers wish they had the comparative luxuries of the A and B workers. This social stratification among workers is necessary to maintain the whole system. The capitalists look on and laugh. But of course, the capitalists themselves rely on the machine to maintain their own power through its most oppressive organs, its police, soldiers, and bureaucrats. Everyone has a role to play. Most seem to be suffering for it in some way. So why do we allow it to continue? PM argues that the machine offers each fraction of the workforce a special deal in order to put up with its discontent. The machine cannot exist solely on repression. The cost would be too high. It would not be sustainable. So it says, give them bread and circuses too. We give and give and give and it takes and takes and takes, but it also gives something back. And because there's always someone who gets back less than we do, 
we're motivated to keep things as is for fear of losing our place in line. Thus, the machine is protected from change by its inertia. Each type of worker gets a different type of deal. Of course, it's more complicated than what PM presents, with significant overlap and divergence, but here's his simple model. The A deal represents our consumer society. With all its goods and experiences, Starbucks, video games, iPhones, Shein, the MCU, Amazon Prime, KFC, fine wine, and more. But it's empty. It exists to keep us from confronting the reality that our lives are not ours. We are constantly kept busy, constantly looking forward to the next thing to consume. And at this point, it doesn't even matter how abundant things are. Everything feels as though it has been mass-produced into the same grey sludge. The quality of life has been sacrificed for the quantity of things, funneled towards us by algorithms designed to sort and standardize so it can monetize every second and every square foot of space on Earth, physically and virtually. And of course, work remains miserable and deadly, while the privileges of the ideal are continuously watered down by stagnating wages and increasing work hours. The B deal is mostly a product of the pre-collapse Soviet Union, but its echoes can be found wherever workers are employed by the state. In fact, I see many parallels to the government workers of my country, Trinidad and Tobago, which is far from Marxist-Leninist. The classic industry worker state arrangement of the B deal promises job security, guaranteed incomes, and social benefits through the state. But the B deal can be frustrating, demoralizing, apathy-inducing, productivity is low, bureaucracy is slow, workplaces are overstaffed, and scarcity seems common. Despite its offered benefits, the state is, in the end, just another face of the machine upon which the workers are exploited and become dependent. Finally, the C deal represents the progress and development promised by the machine that is inevitably paired with violence, exploitation, and poverty. These things have existed throughout human history, but although the poor historically lacked many material goods, their basic needs were accounted for through family and community, by which they also enjoyed a wealth of culture. The industrial work machine has exploited and destroyed much of that wealth, and replaced it with its miseries. The work machine brings development, whether as a colonialist, an independence leader, a state capitalist, or a private capitalist. This development brings the benefits of modern technology, medicine, and sanitation, but also the loss of local resources, enclosure, expropriation, exploitation in the global market, interventions, massacres, epidemics, famine, repression, disillusionment, and dependence on centralized states. The machine promises progress, but as time goes on, these illusions fall by the wayside. Most that are sold the sea deal may never enjoy all the rewards promised by the machine. It is a mirage. The only way out is through global change. So now we understand that we live under the planetary work machine. What's more, we are the planetary work machine. What are we going to do about it? Having been thoroughly inculcated with the logic of the machine, the first impulse of many is to merely tinker with it, work within its logic. The realists propose that we use the machine to reform the machine, one step at a time. Let's introduce a universal basic income, a four-day work week, robust public transportation, greater municipal autonomy, investment in solar energy, recycling initiatives, etc., and etc. And these reforms do sound good. They're reasonable and certainly realizable. They would make people's lives a bit better. But they don't bring an end to the planetary work machine. Even if the machine systems weren't designed to defang such reforms on the national level, generating apathy towards even the idea of political engagement in each successive generation, such reforms are insufficient on the global stage, where regardless of how we may tweak an individual component of it, the total machine endures. So then what? Give up? Bask in illusion? Go out like kamikaze? Retreat to a commune? Well, you know, maybe that last one. But first, ask yourself. Forgetting practicality. Forgetting realism entirely. How would I really like to live? 
In what kind of society, or non-society, would I feel most comfortable? What do I really want to do with myself? What are my true wishes and desires? PM says that because the machine has formed our present reality and trained us to see in its ways, we accept it. And by that acceptance, we are its victims. PM's solution lies in stepping outside of the machine's reality and into a second reality. The strange world of Below Below. A second reality requires a second vocabulary. Enter Asir Pili, the artificial vocabulary of concepts that make up the world of Below Below. These invented words serve two functions. They exist to shed the baggage of old ideas, and they exist to give old ideas new life and expanded meanings. What is Below Below? It is a modest proposal for the new arrangements on the spaceship after the machine's disappearance. What is Below? We shall soon see. My only request, as we explore these ideas, is that you treat it as a thought exercise. Suspend your disbelief. Lighten up. This text is unlike any other I've explored before on this channel, so this video should be treated as similarly distinct. I'm sure you got that vibe already. The book of Below Below is bold enough to veer off the well-trodden path of dry theory, presenting a motley of interesting ideas, even ventured into the realm of world-building and speculative fiction. For that, regardless of my critiques, it has my respect. Take it as seriously or unseriously as you need to, to invigorate your imagination. The Asa Pili, a glossary of sorts, begins with Ibu. Fair warning, the Ibu is a concept built off of solipsism. That means it is based on the idea that only one's own mind is sure to exist, and everything else, including the external world and other minds, is uncertain or a product of one's own consciousness. If that understandably controversial philosophical perspective makes you uncomfortable, fair enough. I'm not a fan of it either. And there's a mention of suicide in the mix as well. In any case, proceed with caution, or not at all. This is the world of Below Below. Ibu is an entity, a person, an ego of sorts. There's only one Ibu with a mortal body, but it behaves as if there were billions. The Ibu creates its reality, then gets lost in it, trapped in it. It forgets that just as it has dreamt a nightmarish, masochistic world of conflict, crisis, and suffering, it is just as capable of creating reality far more pleasant. But the Ibu engages in self-deceit. It defines itself as powerless and grants power to external authorities, God, the state, progress, etc. It invents a sense of life that it cannot reach, perpetuates in its own unhappiness. It invents others, projects consciousness onto them, relationships with them, and institutions to categorize them, such as families or nations. It invents society and subjects itself to its web of norms and rules. Trapped in a cycle of self-deception and external projection, the Ibu cannot break free. Unless it chooses to end its reality or to create something different. When the Ibu joins with 200 to 500 other Ibus, it forms a bolo. It's mostly self-sufficient home on Spaceship Earth. A bolo involves a basic agreement for living, producing and dying between Ibus. In it, Ibus grow up, care for each other, learn from each other, and can come and go as they please, associating themselves in co-housing arrangements, called Kana, individual units, or other domestic situations, like couples, polycules, extended families, and co-parenting collectives. The self-sufficiency of bolos are a necessity to guarantee its independence and prevent its exploitation. As PM notes, no democratic system could be more democratic than the material, existential dependence of its members. There is no democracy for exploited, blackmailed, economically weak people. Such self-sufficiency is based on two key elements, Kodu and Sibi. The first, Kodu, is the agricultural basis of a bolo's independence, consisting of whatever fields, 
pastures, groves, gathering areas, fisheries, food forests, and other geographical features upon which the bolo relies for its food, which is part of its culture. How agricultural labor is organized varies among different bolos. In some, it is less important compared to other occupations, but even in such cases, agricultural tasks are shared among Ibus, ensuring that it doesn't overly limit their freedom. For other bolos, Agriculture is a core element of their cultural identity and a source of pleasure. Countryside bolos will have easier access to land for cultivation, whereas urban bolos may use small urban gardens in conjunction with agricultural zones just outside the city. The second, Sibi, is the fabric cultural basis of a bolo's independence, encompassing everything related to the production, use, repair, and distribution of goods and services, including buildings, fuel supplies, electricity, water, tools, machines, clothing, furniture, raw materials, transportation, crafts, arts, and more. The Sibi of a bolo may also relate to its cultural identity. You may have bolos entirely organized around clothing, or shoemaking, or mechanics. Here, work is driven not by market forces, but by the inclinations and passions of its producers, who have direct control over what and how they produce. The distinction between work and leisure is fuzzier, and there's more room for feedback and customization thanks to a direct connection between producer and consumer. Self-sufficiency for the bolos does not mean isolation from everything beyond. Bolos and ibus develop means of exchange in the form of gifts, buni, barter agreements, fino, resource pools, mafa, and local markets, sadi. Despite the ideal of self-sufficiency, except in rare circumstances, most bolos will have some degree of dependence on those outside of them. A bolo's degree of autonomy or interdependence is based on practical considerations as well as cultural identity, also known as Nima. A bolo's agriculture, called Kodu, may be self-contained, but areas of fabriculture, or Sibi, like water, Suru, energy, Pali, transportation, Fasi, and medicine, Bete, will typically require significant cooperation between the bolo's to sustain. Bolos worldwide share basic functions and obligations, known as sila. Sila can also be viewed as the rule of hospitality, which we owe to each other as guests on Spaceship Earth. Sila contains the following agreements. 1. Every ibu gets a taku, which is a container that measures 50 by 50 by 100 centimeters, over whose contents it can dispose at its will. The taku is the sole domain of personal property and absolute privacy in an otherwise shared world. 2. Every ibu can get from any bolo one daily ration of 2,000 calories of local food. By local food, I mean that a visiting ibu has to adjust to what's produced according to local conditions and prepared according to local culinary culture. An ibu can't expect a bolo to take on the time, energy, and resource cost of import just to accommodate their specific palate. A bolo is expected to be able to feed 30 to 50 guests out of its own resources whenever such guests arrive. This agreement is called Yalu. 3. Every ibu can get housing for at least one day in any bolo. This agreement is called Gano, and it goes beyond space for guests but also incorporates how the overall system treats with space. Overall, a bolo is easily walkable and incredibly lively. Unlike traditional property systems, individuals cannot claim control over buildings they do not use, so roofs, garages, offices, warehouses, streets, squares, and more are open for new utilizations and adaptations whenever they become available, guided by sustainable design and based on vernacular material. 4. Every ibu is entitled to appropriate medical care in any bolo. This agreement is called bete, which also encompasses the social, cultural, and medical dimensions of healthcare as a whole. Every bolo is able to treat simple wounds and frequent illnesses on its own through clinics organized by a permanent team of experienced ibus and pharmacies containing the most frequently used medicines of the bolo. 5. Every ibu is entitled to travel anywhere at any moment. There are no borders on Spaceship Earth. Anyone can vote with their feet when necessary. This agreement is called FASI, 
and it also involves the overall system of transportation and traveling, with all its pleasures and none of its stresses. These systems include pedestrian accessibility, cycling infrastructure, sleds, skis, skates, trolleys, trams, trains, buses, boats, and the occasional Boeing. And sometimes, when needed, of course, cars. 6. Every Ibu is free to choose, practice, and propagandize for its own way of life, clothing styles, language, philosophy, etc. This agreement is called NAMI. 7. Every Ibu can challenge other Ibu or a larger community to a duel, overseen by a duel committee, according to the rules of the duel, known as Yaka. I won't launch into the details of Yaka because it kind of feels like a recipe for blood feuds in my opinion, but it's an interesting idea I'd invite you to read upon yourself. 8. Finally, and perhaps most disturbingly, every Ibu is entitled to a capsule with a deadly poison allowing it to end its own life whenever it wants, with help if needed. This agreement is called Nugo. A bolo can refuse Sila if there are more guests than it is expected to handle, which is 10% of its population. Otherwise, failure to observe the agreements of Sila is a major mark on the munu, that is the honour or reputation, of the involved bolo. But why should a bolo respect Sila, respect the entitlements of strangers? Because every Ibu is a potential stranger. Every Ibu is free to travel and enjoy the benefits of Sila. And such travellers may provide their own benefit to the Bolo in the form of ideas, fashions, products, stories, or otherwise. Other than the shared binds of Sila, Bolos are strikingly diverse thanks to territorial, architectural, and most importantly, cultural variety. In larger cities, a Bolo may be a block or an apartment complex. In the countryside, a bolo may be a small town or a group of farmhouses. In an archipelago, a bolo may be an associated group of atolls. In a desert, a bolo may be a route of nomads. In a lake, a bolo may be a collection of boats. A bolo may occupy a castle in the English countryside or set up shop in one of the dead malls of North America. The possibilities are truly endless. The Nima a bolo's cultural identity, deserves special attention. The vision of bolo bolo goes beyond mere practical arrangements. Every Ibu has their own vision of life and convictions, which, shared with others, becomes the basis of their bolo's nima. The nima encompasses various aspects of culture, including habits, lifestyle, philosophy, language, values, clothing, cuisine, sexual behavior, education, religion, architecture, arts, rituals, music, and more. Nima may be drawn from ethnic traditions, philosophical currents, sects, historical experiences, common struggles, or newly invented forms. They may be open or closed, enduring or impermanent, old or new. In one region, you may find a Rasta Bolo, a Gamer Bolo, a Jim Bolo, a Cottage Core Bolo, a Swahili Bolo, a Tao Bolo, an Anthropology Bolo, and a biker below. All sorts of expressive and uplifting Nimas will thrive. But of course, some repressive and conservative Nimas may also take root. The freedom to choose is, as always, a double-edged sword. But there are means in place to disincentivize destructive Nimas. A bolo with a bandit-oriented Nima may try to loot and pillage the neighboring bolos, in the interconnected world of below below, with the absence of money and traditional property, combined with the presence of social ostracization, collective resistance, and internal strife, such a practice would be quite unattractive and marginal in the grand scheme of things. Pili encompasses all aspects of expression and communication in the world of below below. From the conversations between Ibu, to the media landscape, to the education systems, here the news becomes relevant to one's personal life again, and everyone is both a student and teacher simultaneously. Rather than a state taking on the task of education, learning and teaching have become intrinsic parts of daily life, as wisdom, know-how, theories and technical skills are shared freely in settings like workshops, kitchens, farms, libraries and laboratories. There is no standardised compulsory education system, but voluntary, cross-bolo education systems exist. 
For more specialized skills, engineers, doctors, and others take on apprentices to pass along their practical and theoretical knowledge, or lend their training in open academies that adhere to the principles of hospitality and welcome Ibus across the world. Speaking of the world, Spaceship Earth is known here as Asa. Asa is made up of hundreds of regions known as Sumi, which themselves each contain perhaps dozens of voodoo and hundreds of tigers, each with their own bullows. <laughs> Hold on, stay with me. Let me break it all down. An Ibu is a person. When 200 to 500 Ibus come together with a shared Nima or cultural identity, they create a bolo. Some bolos are fairly distant from everyone else, but most bolos, while retaining as much self-sufficiency as possible, usually in groups of 10 to 20, come together in something called a tega, which may be a village, a small countryside, a large neighborhood, or a township of a few thousand people. These tega take on certain practical tasks. Streets, energy, water, factories, workshops, hospitals, emergency aid, transportation, and otherwise. They can also organize and maintain the mafa, a shared pool of material resources like food, clothing, and medicine that can act as a safety net in times of crisis or failures in self-sufficiency. The Tega is kind of like a municipal government, except power flows from below instead of from the top of a centralized regime, and the actual possibilities of such Tegas are limited by the determination of the Bolos themselves. Within a Tega, the Bolos would form a township assembly known as Dala, which involves delegates called Dudi from within the Tega, <laughs> Uh, from within the Tega and from the Dallas of other Tegas to break up any budding isolationist or parochial tendencies. But Bolos and Tegas may not handle everything alone. 10 to 20 Tegas may come together to organize certain tasks with a voodoo, which would be something like a small region, a city, a county, or a canton of several tens or hundreds of thousands of people. A voodoo would have many of the same tasks as a Tega, except on a grander scale but can also take on the responsibility of defending the natural commons and mediating disputes. Again, power still flows from the bottom. Finally, sumis, or regions, vary in composition, but may contain 20 to 30 voodoos, which would be millions of people. The sumi system is primarily geographical, defined by features like mountain ranges, river regions, islands, peninsulas, coasts, plains, jungles, or archipelagos. However, regions are not solely geographical. They also represent cultural unities, such as shared language or dialect, a history of collective struggles or achievements, similar lifestyles, housing styles, religions, institutions, culinary traditions, and more, all contributing to their regional identity. Most exchange and communication among bolos occur within the so-called boundaries of these regions. But regional boundaries are dynamic, and exchange across them is still frequent. Cooperation within and among regions can take many forms, including sumidalas, regional assemblies which can help coordinate tasks such as nuclear waste management, transportation maintenance, emergency aid, conflict resolution, and participation in continental and planetary activities like sports and events. It's a lot to take in, and there's more to the world of Below Below, but this is just a peek into its vast and intriguing lore. PM believed the world of Below Below could be realized worldwide within five years, even going as far as to provide a provisional schedule of events. Rather than thinking globally and acting locally, PM wants us to both think and act globally and locally. After all, why be modest in the face of impending catastrophe? So what's his plan exactly? What strategies can we take on to challenge the planetary work machine and win? How can we destroy the machine without destroying ourselves? As I've been saying, PM argues that we need subversion, which enables us to paralyze sectors of the machine and win short-term victories, and construction, to sow the seeds of below below in the cracks of the machine to see long-term success. The gains we make with subversion must immediately be filled with something constructive in its place, lest the machine conquer those spaces again. Yet, construction should never be used as an excuse to ignore subversion, but subversion alone could only create historical dates and heroes, but little in the way of concrete results. In other words, 
we need both oppose and propose. In other, other words, some madness and badness combination. Construction has to be combined with subversion into one process, substruction. I'll keep my thing brief. Subversion involves a disco of possibilities. Disinformation, disproduction, and disruption. Disinformation involves time theft, desertions, mismanagement, refusal, and more. Disproduction involves sabotage, strikes, occupations, demonstrations, and more. Disruption involves riots, squatting, guerrilla warfare, and the like. Such a disco could only create a crisis for the machine if the different types of workers A, B, and C overcome their differences and work in tandem, creating what PM calls ABC knots, precursors to the bolos. The machine knows subversion is inevitable, and it can handle isolated incidents. But when all together, en masse, these acts of subversion could coordinate a counter machine capable of creating a real challenge. But these ABC knots can effectively develop in the economic core of the machine. In the factories and offices, workers are isolated from each other by positions, wages, hierarchies, and privileges. The knots have to develop where the machine's attention is less concentrated. The margins of the machine, where workers' divisions can be transcended and people can be united, in areas like native place, nature, sexuality, or religion. For these knots to endure, they need to build up their power and engage in everyday, constructive tasks outside of the machine, taking the form of neighborhood centers, food co-ops, and other communal initiatives, organizing mutual help, money-less exchange, and concrete cultural function. They need to build up their collective independence and stabilize their cooperation. To protect themselves from the machine's scrutiny, they must be diverse, invisible, and flexible. In fact, PM argues that the knots should be consciously non-organized and decentralized, constituted only by the accumulation of their collective efforts and recognizing that they cannot face the machine head-on. As he argues, without substantial desertion and mutiny, the ABC knots open themselves only to loss and bloodshed when facing the military and police. Quote, When the machine kills, there aren't yet enough ABC discos. Too many parts of its organism are still in good health, and it's trying to save itself with preventive surgery. The machine won't die of frontal attack, but it can very well die of ABC cancer, learning about it only too late for an operation. For there to be enough ABC knots and discos to disintegrate the planetary work machine, a purely local or regional approach would be insufficient. That's why planetary disco knots, or trico, are essential to facilitate communication and exchange between ABC knots in different parts of the world, fostering personal relationships, practical exchanges of goods, and a planetary approach to the fall of this planetary machine. I think Below Below is a brilliantly creative thought exercise slash blueprint for a future society, despite its flaws. Some have criticized Below Below for its invented jargon, which admittedly may be too daunting to follow at first. Others have criticized its bias towards the countercultural movements of the 60s without examining how the machine adapted to them. Much like the hippie movement, PM believes that ABC knots could be founded on the margins of the machine, in realms like spirituality and sexuality. But I think that all too quickly glosses over how such realms are commodified by the machine, as well as how differences in identity, experiences, and type of worker you are shape even those marginal realms. As much as I appreciate the analogy of cancer in dismantling the machine before it even realizes what's happening, I do think about how much the surveillance state has grown since the time PM wrote about his strategies, and question how long such a movement can go on undetected before the machine finds new ways to adapt. We should also be questioning some of the more iffy concepts outlined in the Asa Pili. I don't know how realistic it would be to try and halt or reverse the growth of cities. As I said before, the idea of Yaka seems like a setup for blood feuds. And perhaps worst of all, I really don't like how PM relates the Ibu to the concept of Nugo, the poison capsule. He talks about how the Ibu could end this ghastly theatre by killing itself and disappearing forever, since there's only one single Ibu in the universe that it has dreamed up for itself. It has no care about surviving dependents, mourning friends, unpaid bills, etc. Its death would be absolutely without consequences. 
I think that's a rather antisocial starting point for a utopian project, born out of a very Western, individualistic conception of personhood, with no sense of rootedness or beingness in community. Earlier, I mentioned the Ibu's clear solipsistic influences. Left unchecked, I think that kind of mindset can end up progressing to the sort of New Age supremacy that characterizes the indigo child, everyone except me, the main characters and NPC type. To them I say, have a little sonder. Solipsism is an interesting thought exercise, but you have to realize you're not the main character of the universe. Each random passerby is living a life just as vivid and complex as your own. To give PM some credit, in the introduction to this second edition, he wrote that A number of readers of Bolo Bolo have been confused or irritated by the ironical or macabre tone of some passages. Some of the more practical suggestions are indeed not to be taken literally. They're more illustrations than instructions. Sometimes it was just the dusty genre utopia that provoked me to make irreverent jokes. But of course I'm serious, and you can be as serious or not as you wish. There's more that could be criticised, more that could be applauded. I like the idea of the planetary work machine. Like any other lens of analysis, it has its gaps, but that's fine. Take what's useful, leave what isn't. Below Below is a genuinely fun read. A great resource for world builders, and certainly deserves points for creativity. PM once said, I am frightened of Below Below. I find that outlook fitting for one who attempts to reimagine the whole world. It's good to consider not only how wonderful your imagined future may be, but also how it may potentially turn for the worst. Whatever future you personally seek, I hope you've been inspired by the strange world of Below Below. All power to all the Ebos. Peace. This presentation has been slightly different from my usual videos, and I really enjoyed the process, even though it took longer. I think more than anything, this book has given me greater fuel for my creative fire. So make sure and check out PM's Bolo Bolo link below if this video has tickled your fancy, because it goes into some details and ideas that I merely glossed over. Also, special thanks to Philosophy Noir, Maud, Aruna Now, Color Mind Tai, and Anansi's Library for their contributions to the chants in the video. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, subscribe, and share with your fellow people. Thanks to the seedlings, the saplings, and especially the roots for making all this possible. Including our newest member, Joe Zonova. You can join these beautiful humans and support me too on patreon.com slash true. Check out my other videos for a range of radical topics. Thanks again. Peace.